Good morning, good morning. What a great day. It's good to see you this morning. Glad that you're here to worship with us. Amen. Got a Bible? Might have it handy. <laughs> we believe in preaching from the Bible around here. Y'all give another praise to the Lord for our band, amen, as the ministry they carry out. It's important that we uh, appreciate the blessings that God has given us. You'll see the title of today's message, God's Intention of Salvation, but before I get to that, two things. One, ladies, I understand your retreat was just spectacular, was it? Amen. So guys, sit near your wives if they're here with you this morning or not doing some of the ministry in the church this morning because the revival's just pouring off of them, amen? I had revival just when Kathy walked in the door, and I needed it, amen? <laughs> so praise the Lord. Second thing is, uh, your prayers were so much appreciated in our Belize conference. We had a, uh, just a really glorious time there with our pastors. We had all but four of our Baptist pastors that sewed up for this year's conference. We were able to minister to them in their churches. And I'm going to show maybe a, a clip or two, just a word I called on testimony from them during the conference. I wish I'd taken more time, but usually my mind focused on about 4,000 other things during those conferences. But I did I was able to catch a couple of testimonies that were given from the pastors, but every one of them. And I thank all those that were there, without exception, came up to me uh, and just spent some time between conferences, meetings, we would talk, and uh, just each one just continued to say the same thing over and over. Tell your church, thank you, thank you, thank you. Tell them that we appreciate more than they understand or realize this conference and what it means to our pastors here in this country. And uh, so on behalf of those pastors, thank you again. That it goes a long way. I know that most of you have not been to one of the pastor's conferences. You're more than welcome to go to any time to any of them. No, I'm not paying you away. <laughs> but you're welcome to come along. We'll put you to work there, amen. And, uh, but it's always a, a great time in the Lord, a great time of encouragement. This year was just a, a real special blessing. Uh, Pastor Nick Harris, Dr. Denny Autry, you know those guys well. They've been in our church and ministered in our church on different occasions. And they just did a, a superb job in ministering to these pastors and ministered to me. Uh, I always need a word from God. I don't know about you, but there's no time that I just think I just don't need a word. If I get to that place, then I'm really in trouble. Amen? Because we all need to be hearing from the Lord. I believe you're going to hear from the Lord this morning. I hope you came ready. Amen? I love the Bible. I know that you do, and I know that our church, this is the focus of all that we're really all about. It just emanates from God's Word to us. Uh, I decided to preach this message. Uh, I think I may have actually preached this sermon before here. Uh, you know, I've been preaching here for 30 years now, 35, 40 years, it seems like. And, uh, but I, I was trying to go back through, I, I keep a record of everything that I preach, and I, I think I found this, that I preached it in 19, I think of January 1989. So there's a few of you might remember that much, but I doubt it. But uh, I've been looking for this, and I finally found this sermon. I, it was a handwritten sermon long before, you know, we had Microsoft Word and the beauties of all that, uh, enjoying it, for, at least for me. And uh, uh, I think I had a dot matrix printer and some kind of other data uh, uh, word processor. But uh, I had Stacy type this out. Of course, I had to communicate what those words mean. I don't write in English nor any other language. So <laughs> I had to translate what I was saying in some of those things. But it's been on my heart to share this because it really gets back to us as a church, but us as individuals. What, what is God's intention in saving humanity? What, 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 was, what was this really all about? And let me say this as I get into this. I believe there is ultimately, first and foremost, a real gross misunderstanding of what it does mean to be saved. What it really means to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I think the church has fallen well short of that because we're preoccupied in so many other things. But I think it's once we understand what God intended in salvation to begin with, and we get it right in our life, it's going to make a radical difference within us. Because it gets us back to God's original purposes and intent. When we understand, what does it mean to, to know the Lord? What does it mean to be saved? Because I, I like that word. Don't you all like the word saved? I know there's a lot of modern uh, schools of preaching that tell us not to use Bible words like that because it, it confuses the poor, ignorant, lost. So, <laughs> well, I was a poor, ignorant, lost, and I understood it. Amen. And I'm really the dumbest of the poor ignorant lost, by the way. So if I can get it, I know you can get it. Uh, but if we need to understand what that word means. What does it mean to be saved? I mean, saved. Saved, saved, saved from what? Saved to what? Saved for what? And we need to get that, that understanding of just what it really means. And what was God's original intention in this whole idea of coming and saving humanity to start with and even creating humanity? What was God's purpose? 
And just let me have, we have a, a passage of Scripture. In fact, many theologians call this passage of Scripture God's, God's intent, you know, uh, God's declaration of intent, God's declaration of purpose. So let's just stand in honor of, even if it's just one verse, I want us to honor the Word this morning by, by standing at, 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 and, and hearing what He has to say to us. If you want to open your Bible to Genesis chapter 1, you can. We're going to be making some references back to that in a moment, the chapter itself in about seven or eight verses in there. But this verse, I want you to really collect this in your heart and mind. Then God said, let us make man in our, in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every uh, creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. In this, God's direct declaration of intent. May the Lord God give us clarity as we talk about this. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So God's given us an idea of what this whole idea of creation. Now, now for those who don't remember the creation account, who haven't read Genesis lately, let's go back to the beginning. And by the way, if you really want to know what God has in mind and what he has in store and what his purposes are, it's always good to go back to the beginning and see what he originally said and what was on the mind and the, and the heart and the plans of God. Remember, I've taught you the word before, it's that theological terminology that describes an aspect of God's character. It's called immutable, the, the immutability of God. And when we talk about God being immutable, that means God's mind is set, all right? God's, God's, God's ways are the same yesterday, today, and forever. What God has been for, He's always been for, and will always be for. What God is against, He's always been against, and He'll always be against, all right? That's the, that's the immutable nature of God. He, he does not change. He is the Lord God. And praise the Lord, that's, that's a beautiful thing for us as Christians. We don't have to worry about what God's going to do tomorrow. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What He's given us in His Word, that's what He's going to do, and that's how we can determine you know, God in, in our life and how He works in our life. Now, if we can get back to this issue of salvation, guess what? If I, have, if I understand this declaration of intent, this has to do with God's purpose for humanity, and I mean, let's talk about it specifically, this has to do with God's plan for you, God's plan for me. And so, perhaps today you find yourself in kind of a decision process. Anybody here have to make decisions this week? Some of you have to make some big decisions, all right? Some of you are facing some critical things, perhaps, and finance, and home, and marriage, and whatever it might be. But whatever the decision is, man, I think if you get this down today, it's going to resolve your issue. I really believe it's going to help you make the right and, and, the, and, and the proper decision. If you fail to choose correctly, it, it's always disastrous, isn't it? So we want to be able to choose correctly. And so I think if you just open your heart and your mind to what God is going to say to you in this passage and through this passage today, it's going to give some clarity to God's will and God's purposes for your life in very clear, general areas that you have to deal with all the time. So let's get to this. If, if this is God's direct declaration of intent, it's certainly important that I had better understand it. And I better be able to wrap my head around this to some degree because I don't want to fail. And if I don't understand this, I can guarantee you I will fail. A lot of people are struggling along in their Christianity because they don't understand what God's really up to within the context of their own personal salvation. And they're making bad decisions and they're ending up in the places they don't want to be and they're failing in, in a lot of regards and just missing perhaps God's will in their life in some very clear ways and they're just not seeing it and not, they're not getting it, getting it. So it's important we understand this. Let me say in, in introduction as well that if you follow this Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, you know, God, God's in his creation process. You know, in verse 4, he created these things, and God said, that is good. If you go on down, he's still in the creation process, and, you know, the air and the ferment, all these things to be done, the plant life, the animal life. In, in, verse, in verse 9, God says, and he saw the holy done, and he said, that is good. He continues with the process in creation, and you get down to verse 18, and God saw what he'd done, and he said, that is good good all right he goes into verse 21 and god said that is good and verse before this verse and god saw what he'd done he says that is good all right in fact there's all these goods god said this is good 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 they're all laid out for us so help let me help you understand that what god is doing here is good so if you're hearing something else in your head, rattling around, it says, this is not good, God's will is not good, God's way is not good, God's purpose is not be good, if I do what God wants me to do, it's not be good, that's a lie out of hell. Because what God is doing and what he's initiating, you mark it down, it's good. How do we know? Because he said it was good. That should be clarity enough. Now, you kind of watch this because in verse 26, you get this climactic declaration of what God is saying. And so God has said, everything I've done here, 
is good. So I'm going to make man now, and I'm going to put him in the midst of all this good, because I've created good. And he creates man, and we know he forms him out of the dust of the ground, and God said, that's good. I mean, even the ants were good. Now, you may find this hard to believe in Houston, the next one. Even the mosquitoes are good. Me and the mosquitoes were having rounds yesterday, and I was thinking, this is not good. <laughs> I was working around my place, and, you know, I have lots of places, and about two and a quarter acres I live on where mosquitoes just love to come fellowship. And when they get in fellowship, they always leave little more mosquitoes behind them. And they love me. I don't know about you. Some of you don't have a trouble, you know, when you walk outside. You know, I, it, like Kathy, mosquitoes don't ever seem to bother her. They fly around her, and, you know, they just sing to her. They see me, and they're singing, yeah, but they're singing nothing but the blood of Joe. <laughs> I don't know if there's something attracted. I don't know if I just got sweet smell and savor about me like the Bible says. I don't know if I just look like warm meat or whatever it is. They just come and they congregate around me. And not only they congregate, they like to get involved. They stick me, you know, and they bite me. And it's not good. But God said they were good. So I don't, you know, these, these, we need to get the, all the mosquitoes saved again. That's all I can say about it. We need to have a mosquito revival and see if they come back to Jesus. Amen? But... God creates this beautiful garden, and he places man in the midst of the garden. And we know the story. There's two trees there. There's the tree of life, all right? And then there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's the tree of life, which represents the perfect purpose and will of God. Ultimately, we'll see later on in the New Testament how this represents the Lord Jesus Christ, and eating the fruit of that tree is, is life-giving. And then there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God says to Adam, you know, you don't eat of that tree, but it, it became, everything else, everything in the garden is yours. Everything, every life-giving, fruit-bearing plant in this place, and you can't even imagine probably how many types of fruit there were in the garden. All right? Just the beauty of the place alone, God says, it's knock yourself out. It's all yours, but just that one's mine. Now, the simple lesson, and I don't care if you're a, a, a Reformed theologian, a Calvinist, or, or an Arminianist, or whatever little camp you might fall into, but let me say this. No matter where you fall in this camp, God makes it very clear in the beginning, if Adam is going to be what God wants him to be and live up to the potential and experience the joy that God has created him to live in, he's going to have to make some decisions, and he's going to have to choose correctly. And if he doesn't choose correctly, it's going to cost him big time. It's the same for our life. We're going to have to learn to choose correctly. The last couple of sermons that I have preached to you personally have been dealing with the importance of making right choices and that we are in a crisis situation in the world that we live in and we have got to learn to make right decisions. And should we fail to make the right decisions, we're going to end up in some extreme, difficult, bad places in our life. If man's going to be what God wants him to be, he's going to have to make some choices. So God places him in the garden, and then all of a sudden, after all these goods, you know, that we've seen here, six goods, God comes up with the first one. Adam, it is not good for you to be alone. It's not good for you to be alone. Now, why is it not good? All of a sudden, good, 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 and now we have a not good. Well, it's not good because you ladies aren't here yet. Can I get an amen? amen. All right. Uh, but that didn't last long. Pretty soon it got real bad. We know the story, right? We'll come back to that in a moment. Adam, it's not good for you to be alone. He places him in the garden. I'm thinking, Adam's thinking, hey, what's alone? You know, I'm pretty happy here. I got all the everything. God says, I, I'm going to make you something that's going to be, that's going to complete you. All right? Now, please understand the word complete. It doesn't mean finish. I'm going to finish you, Adam. <laughs> now, some men think their wife is somebody who's there to finish him off, you know. Uh, but the wife in this role, if what God is, these are conigdo, that's so someone who brings fullness and completion to the man's, you know, life and to, to his well-being and to the wholeness. And they too, they're not just operating individually. They, they operate now as one. And God, God made them something unique to complete and to fulfill. Now, God says, I'm going to do this. Now, I'm sure Adam is wondering, well, how are we going to do this? And God says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go name all the animals. Now, that does seem a little bit bizarre. I, I used to talk to uh, young couples a lot in my earlier days of ministry when, uh, when young people thought I had some intelligence levels. Then I got old. It's amazing on their mindset, you get old, you don't have any intelligence anymore. But they'd ask me, how do you know, uh, you know, how do you, I'm looking for the right person. You know, how do I find that right person? 
How, do I, how am I going to know it's the right person? Well, I think we take the, the message that God gives to Adam, you go do what I tell you to do. Go do what I tell you to do, I'll take care of the rest. All right? You just do what I'm telling you to do, I will take care of the rest. We have to trust the Lord with that. Now, I don't know if Adam thinks he's going to go find his mate in the garden. We don't have all the details there. You know, if he is, I'm sure that was probably interesting. He's walking through the garden, he's like, oh, what's going to complete me? And out around walks, you know, a, a giraffe. Oh, Lord, I hope that's not her. <laughs> or a hippo, you know, some other animal in the creatures crawling around. No, God brings him back. We know the story. And he puts Adam to sleep, and he takes out of Adam a rib from his side and makes a bride. Now, certainly we understand the theology of that and the prof prof prophetic picture that, that out of the side of the Lord Jesus Christ also came a bride, that it cost him his blood, all right? So Adam brings... Adam and Eve, they're, they're brought together and they're placed in the garden and there's a responsibility they have to make the right choice and to not eat of the tree. We soon know what happens. And now we all of a sudden we've had all these good, 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 goods. And now before we get to the fall of man, catch what happens in the scripture. After a woman gets on the scene and God looked at everything he'd done, he said, hey, that's very good. And it's still really good for you ladies at this point. But then she doesn't fulfill her role as the Ezra Kenigdo that we've talked about in marriage retreats before, as the helpmate, it is interesting that God creates the Adam, God creates Adam, and then he puts the trees there in the garden, they're already there, but he creates Adam, puts him in the garden, and then he brings him his wife, and I think she's supposed to be there to make sure that he doesn't eat of the fruit of the tree, and then Satan comes and appeals to her, and, and it's a whole new story now that man has fallen in his sin. All that God had intended now is in a place of absolute failure. It's not where God wanted to be. Now, this morning, as we look at this passage of Scripture, I think we need to be honest with ourselves to see where are we and are we where we're supposed to be in this whole process of the Lord changing our hearts and changing our lives. Because God is up to something, folks. And by the way, we'll see in a moment that God didn't fail here. Man failed. Everybody wants to blame God every time something goes bad in the world. Have you noticed that? But the responsibility does not fall upon God. It falls upon man and the decisions he's made because he unloosed this horrible thing called sin. And man has fallen in his sin. And I don't believe that we'll truly understand where we are and what God has for us in our life now and how God is raising up until we see how really far we have fallen. Sin has done its dirty work in creation, and sin has done its dirty work in our lives. And if we don't understand this, and we don't see what God has brought us out of, too many people will stand around and stay in the place that they're in instead of moving forward to what God's will and purpose is for their life. Catch what he says here. He says, God said, let us make man. For what? How? What's the reason? What's your purpose? Let's make man in our image according to our likeness, and let's give him dominion. Now, that's pretty much the three points of our message. First is being, let's create man in our image. God's original intent in creation of mankind and in salvation of mankind is to create someone who is there to be an extension of his presence. So wherever Adam was, God was. Up until the fall, you know, Adam is fully alive in God. The Bible says, Adam, the day you eat of this fruit, that's the day you'll die. The day that Adam ate of the fruit is the day that he died spiritually. And the presence of God departed from off his life. The presence of God that he had walked in, the fellowship of having God in him, on him, uh, upon him, and around him is now gone. It's, it's absent from him now. He runs and he hides in his sin and his shame. He's no longer the extension of God's presence that God had designed for him. But the idea was in God creating man, remember this, that Satan has been plunged to the earth, all right? And now Satan roams this planet, cast out from heaven, rejected along with one-third of the heavenly host, and demons now inhabit this planet. And God is going to take the planet back. And God is going to... Now, this may be a little heavy, but you can chew on it a little bit later, all right? God is getting ready to begin the process of the eradication of sin, which Satan started in the whole cosmos. And if you understand Colossians a little bit, you see how that God has now taken man who has fallen lower than the angels. The Bible says we're created below the angels and is going to take common man and destroy the devil. And we'll follow the story. I'll, I'll, we'll explain it as we go. So here we have man. Here's Adam now. He is now the very representative of God in person. So wherever he is, God is. And he, Adam now is God's way of invading this planet with time and sense and a real world. 
Every time Satan saw Adam and Eve, he saw God. All right? He saw God. And you know that ticked him off. <laughs> you know that he's infuriated and he hates God and now he hates man. You say, what does God look like? God looks like man when he's filled with the Holy Spirit in his life. I remember my, you know, some of y'all know Mickey Bonner who passed away not so many years ago, who preached a lot in our church, was a real mentor in my life. But uh, I remember my mom, she was, she was a big Mickey Bonner fan. She loved Brother Mickey. But I remember after a meeting in the Bible conference one night we were in, my mom came up to Mickey and kind of took him, tugged on his shoulder, and she says, are you sure not, you're not really Jesus in disguise? <laughs> what a compliment, amen? But that's what God has intended, that Jesus would be manifest in our lives that Christ would be seen in our life. And this is Adam. He's an extension of the presence of God. This is exciting that he's there to make the planet know about God. The second thing it says, let's create him after our likeness. And this deals with the, the character of God. Wherever Adam is, he is now an expression of this holy, divine, moral quality of all that God is. You, I think you find that wrapped up in a real kind of nice nutshell in Galatians 5 when it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. All right? The fruit of the Spirit is love, and joy, and peace, and kindness, and temperance, and meekness, self-control. You see, that, that's, that has to do with the quality. That's, if those elements are in yours, and they're abounding, and, and you're a fruitful believer, then that's literally, it's the character of Christ, and, the, and, the, and the God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Spirit being manifest through your life. And Adam is to become this, this, this extension of God's character. He's, he's been created to literally manifest the personal character qualities of God himself. The third element of this declaration of intent is this, and let's give him dominion over the earth. Catch this. Adam reigned on the planet. He's the little G of the world, <laughs> basically. He's the God of the, part, or the world. Little G, all right. As long as he's in submission to God, listen, there's nothing that Adam had to fear there's nothing that would best him. The lions aren't going to eat him. Mosquitoes won't even bite him. He's in control. All right? He has authority. The Bible says you give him authority over the fish in the sea. Honey, you want fish tonight for dinner? Yeah. Trout come up. Oh, don't trout salmon come up. <laughs> he has authority over the beasts of the field, the animals. All creation is under his dominion. The weather. The weather is under his authority. All right? Nothing got the best of him. It was all under God's control, which God had invested in man as man reigned with God. So you see, he's an expression. We said an extension of the presence of God. He's an expression of the very personal character of God, and he's an exhibition of the very power of God until the fall. Now watch what happens. Here's man living in this elevated place of walking with God. And sin enters in. And no longer is man walking with God. He's separated from God. He's experienced a literal death of separation. He's, the presence of God has departed from him. He's fallen from this upper level that he's been living on in, in, in fellowship with God and ruling and reigning with God. Now he's fallen to a lower level. No longer does he live by the word of God. And the will of God are the purposes of God. Now he lives on this subhuman level. And by the way, I say subhuman because that's where we are still today. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you're still subhuman. God didn't create you to be that way. We see what God has created us for. So we need Christ in our life if we're ever going to rise out of the muck and the mire of sin and filth. But man has fallen. I, I, I think we might really get a, a better picture when we die and get to heaven. <laughs> or when the rapture takes place, to see just how far we have fallen away from God and just how isolated we made ourselves because we chose ourselves over God. And man remains in this fallen sinful state, this, this state of perversion and this state of corruption until the blood of Jesus is applied to his life and then God raises him back up. And I don't think we understand the depths of of the glory of God's grace on our life until we really can take an honest look and see just how far we fell into our sin. Adam's no longer an extension of the presence of God. He's now an extension of his own selfish, egotistical will. Me, mine, I, what I want, what I desire. He's no longer an expression 
of the gracious character of God anymore. Now he's an expression of his own immoral self. The lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes. It's all just a perversion of what God had intended for him. And he's no longer, obviously, an exhibition of the power of God. He's more an ex exhibition of the weakness of man. And we continually have now surrendered ourselves to obedience of our own flesh and to our bondage to Satan. That's a fall. Would you not agree? He has taken a terrible fall. But catch this. God didn't give up. In fact, God didn't fail, as we said before. God had already fashioned a plan. If you read Revelation 13, 8, I believe that's the passage. It, says, you know, it talks about the land that was slain before the foundations of the earth. What does that mean? A lamb slain before... Jesus is that lamb. And it's telling us that long before creation, long before man was created, God, knowing man would fall and fail in his corruption and sin and choose against him, God provided a way of escape. A plan was already placed. There was a covenant made between the Father and the Son. If we study the Scriptures, we understand that there's covenant agreement made between the Father and the Son, that if we would come to Christ, that we would not be cast out. That if we come to Christ, we would now be united with Him in a new life and salvation. So we're placed now, a choice now, that has to be made to return to what God has given us. And how do you do that? You have to return to Jesus Christ. John the Baptist has spoke of him, remember? He says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Here's God's Lamb, the Revelation 13, 8 Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. The way that God's going to deal with us is now through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, because everything that was good has now been perverted. Everything that was right is now wrong, and we're in the wrong, and we we're corrupt in our sin in the wrong. But God now comes with an avenue that was enacted and planned before the foundations. That means before the earth was created, it was already settled between the Father and the Son. And so Jesus steps on the scene. And by the way, Jesus demonstrated that a man can be everything that God wants him to be. Jesus, he's the Lamb. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews puts it. He says, He hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the world. Now, he, the first one, is God, all right? The second he there is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who has been made in the brightness of his glory. He's the one who is the express image of his person. He's the one upholding all things by the word of his power. When he purged our sin and sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. God said, I have an answer to your dilemma. God says, I have a resolution to the problem. And I'm going to do it through my son. But he's going to become a man. And we're going to discover that a man can be what God wants him to be. And Jesus demonstrated with his very life when he became a man that he was everything we needed him to be. The Bible says in the beginning God created man to be an extension of his presence. Well, look, here comes the Lord Jesus Christ. No one more like God because he has God is on him and God is in him. Jesus has told the disciples very clearly. In fact, at his birth, what was the announcement made? His name is Jesus, but he shall be called what? Emmanuel, which means God with us. The angels are making this declaration that here's the fulfillment of everything that God intended at the beginning, that here would be one who would be the very presence, extension of the, of the presence of God himself, Emmanuel. Jesus was talking to the disciples. Remember the discourse where Philip asked him, you know, Jesus is talking about the Father. And, and Philip said, well, show us the Father. Good, I, I, let us see God the Father. And Jesus turns and speaks to Philip. He said, Have I not been with you so long that you have not seen the Father? For if any man hath seen me, he has seen the Father. You look at me, he says, you see the Father. Jesus was this direct, express image of the Father. Then he's the expression of God's character. The divine character of God is seen in Jesus. He always responded like the Father in every situation. You'll never see Jesus acting outside the Father's will or outside of the character of his Father. I don't care if he's turning over the temples in anger, in a righteous indignation of, of, of the money changers, or you see him acting in sympathy and compassion and forgiving the sins of the fallen and those who know that they're sinners and are humble and broken. In every situation, you see Jesus responding in grace, 
and mercy and love and kindness. I mean, just look at the Galatians 5 through the Spirit again. It's all manifest in Jesus Christ. He always chose the Father's way, even in death, even on the cross, even at the garden. Not my will, but thy will. His final words are, it is finished. What's finished? Everything we decided back before the foundations of the earth. It's done. I have completed your will. And obviously, we don't have to study this very long. He is an exhibition of the very power of God, upholding all things by his mighty word. Nothing ever got the best of Jesus. And I repent, not even the mosquitoes got him. Did they bite him? I'm sure he swatted a few in his day. <laughs> but they didn't make him lose his composure, his cool, get mad. Nothing. Not sickness, not the weather, to the waves, to the wind, to creation, be still, stop. Everywhere he turned, he is an absolute authority of God. He's showing the power and the presence of God everywhere we look. And he says, hey, what you see in me is my Father. And I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me. And the day is coming, and it was fulfilled at Pentecost. When I will be in you, and you will be in me, and our life is here with Christ and God in the Father. You're going to experience what I'm experiencing. You're going to be where I am in the Father. And on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God fell, it brought men back to those who received him, to the place where God intended them to be, to the place of salvation, to a new life, no longer living at subhuman level, but resurrected today, elevated today, now restored today, now reconciled today, brought back to God, made right with God, sins forgiven. Salvation, understanding it, is imperative in your life if you want to be a victorious believer in your life. It's God bringing humanity back to the place that he departed when he sinned and when all men became sinners. And God comes and he makes the way himself through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is that lamb who takes away your sin. Thank God for that. There's no way you could stand and enjoy a moment of gracious prayer and have peace and fullness in your heart if it weren't for having your sins removed. You can stand in the presence of a holy God. You can fellowship with this glorious heavenly Father because God has made you acceptable in his sight because of what Christ has done. Salvation fixing you up to function the way you were intended to function. Does that work better for you? <laughs> Giving you what you need, the, the unction to function in your life. Listen, here's what Paul wrote. He gets it. He says, I'm going to show you a mystery. Basically, he's really referring, I think, back to Genesis. Show you a mystery. It's been hidden from the ages. What is that great mystery? It just means that there's something that God has held in reserve to be exposed at the right time. Now's the right time. What is it? And that the right time is this day and age we're living in, this dispensation of time God's given us. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of what glory? The glory just getting to heaven? That's just part of the deal, folks. All right? The glory of being what God intended us to be. The glory of having Christ in our life. The glory of having a fellowship and a relationship with our Heavenly Father. The glory of living a life that's different and unique and cleansed and whole and forgiven and right with God. Yeah, man sinned. Adam blew it in the garden. He rejected God's will. He ate of the wrong tree. But you and I can come back to the right tree, the tree of, the, uh, of life, which is Jesus Christ, and partake of that fruit. That fruit is Jesus Christ. Eat my flesh, drink my blood means to receive him in all of his power and all of his grace, all of his mercy. Receive him humbly into your life and let him deal with you and change your life. Then at this moment, you become an exhibition you become an extension. You become that expression of God's character, of God's presence, of God's power in your own life. That happens at the moment you come to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And until that moment, you're still not where you need to be. You say, well, I'm a good person. Well, good for you. <laughs> but being a good person, unfortunately, is not good enough. It's not going to get you into heaven. And it's not going to get God into you, which is ultimately what it's really all about, that we become this extension of God's presence, an expression of his character, an exhibition of his power. That's God's plan for your life 
today. Now, back up, hit the brakes, hold that thought. We're talking about choices we have to make in our life. Decisions that we're facing. Conflicts we might be dealing with in our life. This now becomes the filter by which I address all these issues now. Can I make that decision and still be an exhibition of the presence of God? I don't think so. <laughs> Not if it's an immoral choice. Can I, still, can I still do those things, watch those things, listen to those things, and run with that crowd, and still be an expression of God's character? Most likely not. This, this, this is such a, understanding God's original purpose for your life is such a safeguard for making correct decisions in your life. Because then you know what the goal is. And if you understand what the goal is, kind of like a river just kind of helps you get there. It, it carries you. It helps you stay within the wake of God's will and in the wake of God's authority and the wake of God's power in your life. When you start stepping out on the banks, then you get lost in the whole process. We are supposed to be this extension of divine presence. What are, what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying you're God's opportunity to show himself to the world you're in, your time, your space, your sense world around you. In other words, Miss Kathy down here, Pastor Arms' wife, she is God's opportunity to show me what God is like. And I'm the opportunity for her to see what God is like. And if we're not doing that, we're failing in our Christianity. I'm just, I'm, I'm making a miserable mess of it. How I treat her should be a demonstration of God's presence, should be an expression of God's character, should be an exhibition of the power of God. And her relationship, it's back and forth that way. It's with our children. It's with our children with each other. It's with our community. It's with our church. It's within this world that we're living in. Right now, the church is the expression of God's, God's presence in the world. We are literally called the body of Christ. Where we stand together, work together, believe God, and trust God, and pray together. Let me ask you a, a difficult question. Does your spouse see God in you? If not, you're not, you're not, you're missing the mark. And there's another word, you translate it into biblical vernacular, it's called sin. It's just sin. Your kids see God in you? Your brothers and sisters in the Lord see God in you? People at your job, your school, do they see God in you? Because if they're not seeing God in you, man, man we've certainly missed the mark here, haven't we? We're also an expression of his character. What about my personality? What about my character? What about those things? We're not talking about the physical things. We're talking about those intangible things, the, the meekness, the kindness, the long-suffering, the joy, the peace, the love. Oh, Brother Joe, you don't know what I have to deal with. I mean, you've got that excuse. You don't know what to deal with. I know exactly what you have to do. I have to deal with it too. The Bible says we're all tempted in the same ways. I don't think it's foreign to me because it's something you're dealing with. We all deal with the same stuff all the time. But let me put it this way. That's all the more reason why to let God be God. That's all the more reason to understand that I need God's presence. I need God's power. I need the fruit of the Spirit being manifest in my life, in my situations. So I, I come back to grace. I come back to trust in God. I'm supposed to be that expression and that exhibition of the power of God. Well, 2 Timothy 1, 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. The very manifestation of God's presence in my life and God's spirit in my life is it means it, it transforms my, my character. It makes a difference in the way I'm living my life. And I become the exhibition of this power. Well, I... Y'all still listening to me? <laughs> or I'm not letting my circumstances control me anymore. I've been given dominion. And I may not be able to tell the clouds not to rain on Sunday morning, but the clouds can't tell me not to go to church. That's as simple as I can put it. Do I need to say that again for you to get it? <laughs> I may not be able to tell the rain to stop, but the rain doesn't stop me from being what God's called me to be. And I see far too many little wimpy Christians get up on Sunday morning, Oh, it's raining today. Oh, God, help us. The world must be coming to an end. I can't go to church, it's raining. You know what rain does to my hair? <laughs> Those of you who have hair. 
You know what I'm saying? They didn't control me. You don't know my boss. He doesn't control me, and he doesn't control you. You don't know my situation. He doesn't control you. You're a child of God. You have the power of God literally resting in your very being. So start being. You're the light of the world. Man, what a powerful thing the scriptures tell you when it begins to identify who you are in this world. Light of the world, salt of the earth, city set on a hill, candle on a lampstand. Powerful images, meaning that the things around us, darkness doesn't control me. My light shines brighter in the dark. Situation's not going to control me. I, 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 I excel in pressure. Why? Because I have the power of God on my life. I'm a child of God. I'm going to walk in the Spirit. You know, the Bible warns you in the last days there'll be people who, in, in the church, and this is the church age I think we're living in, is what's clearly described here, that in the church there'll be those who have a form of godliness, but they turn away from the power of God. They don't want to shine. They want to be what the flesh wants. They want to be what the world wants. They're not going to stand up. They're not going to be bold. They're not going to speak. They're not going to shine. They're not going to, they're not going to make the difference. It, 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 they just let the things control them instead of controlling. On the back wall, in fact, there's four of them here. One, two, three, four. They're called thermostats. Y'all know what those do, right? If it's hot in here, we can touch those little thermostats and push those little buttons, boop, 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 and make it cold in here if I want it. All right? If it's real cold in here, we want to heat up. You just push a few more buttons. We can, get, we can get how we like it in here. But right beside the thermostat, where it tells you where it's at, there's another little number on the screen, and it's the thermometer. And it tells you what it is. Most people think they're just thermometers. Some of y'all get real good at telling what is. That was not a good sermon. <laughs> this is not a happy day. I'm not having fun. Why? Nobody else is having fun, so I'm not having fun. You know? um, and you, you can just fall right wherever the temperature goes. God didn't call you to be a stinking thermometer. You're the, you're the, you're the trendsetter. You're the temperature setter. You, you make the difference. That's what light and salt does. You know what happens when light comes on here? It just runs the darkness right out of here. You see it run out the windows. Pew, it's gone. <laughs> We're light. We are exhibitions of God's power and his dynamics in our life. And when we fail to be that, then no longer are we winning. We're just losing. And the Bible tells us the answer to that is not having a form of godliness, but receiving God's authority and power in our life. Say, hey, I will live for Christ. I will be a man of God. You will be the woman of God. You're going to be that person God's called you to be. In fact, folks, the beauty of the salvation thing is God is in our life to make us this way. You have what you need on board. Now, you may be saying, I don't think I got it. You got it. Because it's not a it, it's a him. And you have the very power and the presence and the character of God residing in you in the form of the Holy Spirit. Your body is the temple of the Spirit. But if you take your body and you take your mind and you take the members of your body and you do things that are ungodly and God has not called you to be, God has not called you to walk that way, God has not called you to and you just choose to be the thermometer and just do what everybody else is doing and be what everybody else is and being like everybody else, guess what? You're going to be, you're going to be an empty, sad, sorry Christian if you are a Christian. It says, we've got a lot of religious folks. Doesn't mean, folks, you may be the most religious person here, but it doesn't mean you're saved. Religion is not a bad thing when it's, when it's, when it's spirit-directed. The Bible talks about a righteous religion, all right, and what that really is. But there's a form of godliness, which, which is just a religion in and of itself. That you do just enough to kind of soothe your conscience. I don't feel guilty. There's no telling what Brother Joe may hit me on today with. You know, a form of godliness. And, and I, think it's, I think we've adopted that, I think sometimes because the message we hear in church today is just kind of X's, do's, and don'ts. You know, don't do this, don't do this. You know, when I got saved, I had somebody tell me, now, you don't need to do this anymore, you don't need to do this anymore, you don't need to do this anymore. You don't need to do this. Man, if I'd listen to everything they said, my whole Christian life is about not doing. I go, well, here I am, I'm not doing that anymore. Well, what are you doing? Nothing, but I'm not doing that. <laughs> I quit smoking and cussing and chewing and running around with all those that we're doing, you know. I'm, I'm good now, but I'm good for nothing, like salt without savor, right? It's good for nothing. God's got purpose. God's got plan. You say, what is it? It starts here with realizing the very intent of why God created you, and why God made you, and why he recreated you in Christ Jesus, and why you're saved. And if you get this down, folks, the whole world changes before us. But if we fail to catch this, man, what a miserable mess we make in our life. It's not about just 
getting into heaven one day. And that's where a lot of people think salvation. God, God sent Jesus to die for my sins so I don't have to go to hell. Well, that's good, and that's part of it, but that's not it. And there's a lot of people who live that kind of, they, they, they respond to the message. Well, the, the, the pastor said, if I don't believe in Jesus, I'm going to hell. I don't want to go to hell. Anybody here want to go to hell? Nobody wants to go to hell. hell. I mean, if I read the Bible correctly, it's not a place any of us want to be. You know, one thing I've discovered about hell, you read about it, it's hell. <laughs> That's the word hell, all right? It's not where you want to be. And we have a lot of people that don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. Why? Come on, what do you mean why streets of gold? Jasper, pearls, every, I mean, a mansion, hook me up. I'll take a mansion. Anybody, you know, we like mansions. So that's a better deal. I thought, so Jesus come to my heart, so I don't go to hell, so I'm going to heaven. And you scroll without any difference made. Jesus didn't come to die just so you get out of earth and get into heaven. If you understand what the Bible teaches, Jesus came and died and rose and revived. He's coming again. But he did all that so God in heaven could get into your being, into your life and then get out through your life to be an extension of his presence, an expression of his character, an exhibition of his power. If that's not happening, and again, you're a flop. <laughs> no easy way to say that. If that's not in my life, I am failing miserably. Well, I'll tell you honestly, there's been some days when I've been failing miserably. But it's not the course of my life anymore, nor is it the course of your life if you're serious about your walk with God. We shine. We like the darkness because we're changed by the power of God. This is not membership. This is not religion. This is not X's and O's and getting everything just right and keeping the Ten Commandments. This is about us being raised back to, back to that supernatural level where we're no longer living by logic and reason in the flesh. Now we're living by grace and we're living by the Word of God again and we're living by the will of God and we're living by the direction from the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's a whole different world. Don't find yourself, and if you do find yourself back in this old subhuman kind of level, remember, it's time to rise to the occasion. Surrender back to Jesus. And the only way is we have to deny ourselves. We have to die to ourselves, and that's a daily deal. But in thinking about this, it's not we just die to ourselves and we're just kind of there in limbo. We die so we can live. Now there's a life. Now there's a purpose. Now there's a plan. Now there's a way that God wants us to live our life, and that's where life is found. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life. Yes, that's good. But he went on to say, I've come that you might have life abundantly. That's very good. You got that? That's very good. And if you're sitting around wondering if it's just worth it to follow Jesus with all your heart, mind, soul, body, strength, the answer is yes, absolutely, 100%, without a doubt. Can anybody else testify to that? It's worth it. He's worth it. Hallelujah. And this is why Jesus died, so that you could be saved. Would you stand with your heads bowed? I'd encourage you today that if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior, that right there where you're standing, you'd make a real decision of your heart and life. You'd make a real commitment to say, it's all for Christ. It's not for me anymore. I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to follow Christ as my Lord and Savior. Don't be content with just membership. It's a relationship. Get connected. And I will say, folks, for those who have done that, it is a growing process. For some of you, you've gotten dwarfed. You've quit growing. You've gotten stagnant. And I would encourage you today to take this word today, this message today, is a, is a word of hope and a word of encouragement and a word of promise to make a decision today, say, I'm moving forward. I'm laying down these things that I've been going back to. I'm putting down the things that I've been holding on to. I'm correcting. I'm making some course adjustments today in my life. I'm getting rid of the issues that God's dealt with me about today, the disobedience, the sinfulness, the unbelief. I'm laying it at the cross today. And I would encourage believers today, this altar is open. The only thing that would stop you from coming to this altar and getting things right with the Lord today, it's not going to be me or anyone in this audience. It'd be just you. You're the only person you have to walk past today to get it right with the Lord. You're the only one. Nobody's going to withhold you. Of course, the devil will sit there and yell at you, but he can't stop you. You've got to walk past him. And you have the authority to do that and the power to do that. Make a decision today. Correct. Adjust. Grow. Follow Jesus. If you're here without Christ, there's men here in this altar. Anyone would be glad to share with you how you can know Jesus personally. 
But don't be satisfied with anything else but the real deal, and that's in Jesus Christ. Give your heart completely to him. Maybe you're looking for a church home. You believe for the Lord is leading you. Come share that with any of these men. We'll rejoice with you in your decision. But whatever the Lord is leading you today, please respond. Maybe it's just a moment that you need to come and just tell the Lord yes for something he's dealing with you about. Maybe it's tell the Lord I'm giving this up, whatever he's going to do about that. But let's deal with the issues of heart and soul today. Father, as we come to this place of invitation, we realize that you're the one who extends your hand of mercy and grace. You're the one who calls us. You're the one who says, come unto me, all you are heavy laden. Lord, hear our hearts. Draw us to yourself today. Sweet Holy Spirit, peace and grace in this place. In Jesus' name. As we sing, you step out. You respond, have the Lord lead you today. You come. If you someone to pray with you, come as well.